All right, if you'll please take the Word of God and turn with me to the New Testament, to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And we're going to read one verse, and you should be able to memorize this verse tonight. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 27. The Bible says, Neither give place to the devil. Neither give place to the devil. How about you say it with me? Neither give place to the devil. All right, you just about got it. Now, Matt, whether you memorize it or not, we can apply it. It'd be good to memorize it, but we can apply it, and that's what we want to do tonight. And, of course, you'll know that we talked about the devil this morning, and uh, it wasn't in a good way either. And, uh, and we're going to talk about him again tonight. And uh, so let's, uh, let's go to the Lord and ask his help as we talk about this mighty foe. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we're not looking for it, we're looking in it. And as we examine your word, as we look at it tonight, may you help us. May you help us understand some things here tonight, coupled together with some things we learned this morning. May we be prepared, as is inevitable, that we're going to face the opposition of this world that the devil has set up and the way it functions, and the way it works, and the enticements that it brings. And would we have victory over that, Lord? Would you help us to grasp something tonight that would help us, that we would lay hold of it by faith? Maybe someone's here and they don't know you as your personal Savior. Maybe tonight would be the night that they realize that if they don't have your righteousness, if they don't have your forgiveness then they're going to go to the place that's prepared for Satan, the devil. And they don't want to be there. Lord, may they call out on you and trust you tonight as their personal Savior. May they believe that what you did on the cross was satisfactory to pay for our sins. Lord, help us tonight, whatever the need might be, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. The context here in Ephesians chapter 4 that we deal with neither give place to the devil is the context of the believer walking in the new man. A lost man, for the lost man, it is natural to give place to the devil. If you can think back to pre-Christ in your life, before knowing Christ and him making you a new creature, the natural, normal thing was just to give place to the devil. Now, there's some things that the devil wanted you to give place to that you didn't give place to because everybody doesn't struggle with the same thing. Everybody has different personalities, different likes, different dislikes, even when it comes to sin, right? Some sinners don't like some sins and they like other sins. So you don't give in to everything, even as an unbeliever, you didn't give place to everything, but you gave place to what your flesh wanted to and what you desire and what you come to know and desire. Now, for the believer who has put on the new man, it's not natural to give place to the devil anymore. Walking in the Spirit will never yield to naturally giving a place or a position to the devil in our lives. And the Bible says, neither give place or position, it means, in your life and in my life to the devil. Let's go back to 1 Peter 5, which we had talked about this morning. But in 1 Peter uh, chapter 5, and verse 8 and 9, the Bible says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions, afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. We find these phrases here, our adversary, and he is a roaring lion. The devil's already active trying to get a place in every man's life, so let's not give up any ground. He's coming. He's already coming. He's already planning. 
We find the phrase that we talked about this morning, be sober, which means to have self-control, being mentally calm. We found the phrase, be diligent, meaning to stay awake and watchful and to be alert. We find the phrase, resist steadfast, which means to make a solid stand. And the devil does not like Christians and he wants to destroy us. We must be watching and ready to defend the ground that we have received from the Lord by faith. By the way, that's being called a good steward. When we got saved, God gave us new ground. He gave us a new position. He set our feet in a new spot. He gave us new desires because we are a new creature. And we ought to be good stewards of the new things that the Lord's given us in our life. All these new things. Now, there's many more we could talk about. But be a good steward of it. Don't give it up to the devil. Don't give up the ground you have to the devil. Now, the devil will take whatever part of our lives that we give him. It doesn't matter. He'll take it. But we're not to give any position. We're not to give any place to the devil in our lives. By the way, he wants you to believe that he's a giver. The devil's not a giver. He's a taker. So whatever he promises you, he's going to take twice from you. Don't believe that he's a giver. He's a taker. And he will take our love. He'll take our joy. He'll take our peace. He'll take our long-suffering. He'll take our gentleness. He'll take our goodness. He'll take our meekness. He'll take our faith. He'll take our temperance. He'll take our testimony. He'll take our hope. He'll take our assurance of salvation. He'll take our time. He'll take our money. He'll take our wisdom. He'll take our godly desires. All he wants to do is take, and he wants to take everything that God wants to give you out of your life. So saying that, neither give place to the devil. Let's talk about some things tonight about the devil. I want to talk about, first of all, the place that the devil deserves is hell. The place the devil deserves is hell. Look with me at Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel chapter 28. I'm not going to ask you to spell that tonight, but if you can just find it. Ezekiel chapter 28, beginning in verse 12. The Bible says, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Now, I'll go ahead and tell you this as we continue reading here. This is speaking about the devil, Satan. And the Bible says here, Thou hast been in Eden. Remember the Garden of Eden? Thou hast been in Eden, the Garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardis, to topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold, the workmanship of thy tabrets, and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. And I, this is the Lord speaking, and I have set thee so, thou wast upon the holy mountain of God, thou, wast, thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou, thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have, filled, they have filled in the midst of thee with violence. And thou hast sinned, therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings, and they may behold thee. The Bible says here about the devil, he's the anointed cherub. And then the Bible says he was cast out of the mountain of God. Where God was, he said, I'm casting you out. Go to Isaiah chapter 14 with me. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. How art thou fallen? Remember, he just said he cast him out, the anointed cherub, out of the mountain of God. He said, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? 
How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, listen to what he says, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mountain of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that hath made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness, and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of his prisoners? They're going to say these things about him. Now, what the Bible says here in verse 12 and 15 is that he's fallen from heaven... And he'd be brought down to hell. Now, go to Revelation chapter 20 with me. Revelation chapter 20, beginning reading in verse number 1. And this is talking about right there at the beginning of the millennial reign of Christ. The thousand years in which Christ was going to reign on this earth. This is what takes place here. And in verse 1 it says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. Look at verse 10 of Revelation 20. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. It says he's gonna, he was cast there into the bottomless pit, and then he will be taken out, and eventually he's going to be cast into the lake of fire. The Bible said. So the place that the devil deserves is hell, and eventually... In the lake of fire. We see that here. We'll read uh, here in a little bit that hell or the lake of fire where they're going to be cast was not prepared for man. It was prepared for him. And he deserves to go there. So don't ever forget where he deserves to go. And by the way, you can tell him that. (laughs) Devil, I know where you deserve to go. And I don't only know where you deserve to go. I know where you're going to go. And you're going to go there forever. And you'll never be able to molest us anymore in our our minds or our bodies or ourselves and tempt us with anything ever again. So the devil deserves to go to a place called hell and eventually lake of fire. Secondly, the place that the devil desires is the highest place. That's where he desires. Don't forget that. He desires the highest place in your life. Now let me ask you this. What is the highest place in your life? It's the place where the Lord wants to be. He wants to have the preeminence. He wants to be on the throne. He wants to be in control. And Satan wants to be there. Back in Isaiah chapter 14... Isaiah chapter 14, where we're reading about how he wanted to lift himself up to be higher than God. The Bible says in verse 13, all the things he says he wants to do. And listen, he wanted to do this. He wanted the highest place in everything above God. He has the, high, the Lord has the highest place. He wanted the highest. What makes you think he wants any less than us in our lives? Now, he'll take anything. But he wants the highest place. Listen to what he says again. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also in the mountain or the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. He desires the highest place in our lives. But he'll take whatever we give, we, we, he can get from us. But he wants the highest. He wants it all. Now, when we go back 
to uh, Job that we visited this morning. Let's go back to Job here for a second. And in Job chapter 1, let's go back and read some of these verses here again. In Job chapter 1 and verse 6, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered, and said, uh, answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? There is none like that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast thou not made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? That's a good thing to know, right? That the Lord can put a hedge about us. Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put forth, uh, not, put, put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. In, chapter, in verse 22, the Bible says this of chapter 1, In all this, so all these things that happened, um, he, he took care of, Many things there in his, his life, and it brought a lot of things to an end. His family, his crops, his, everything. He was just devastated. And in, the, in verse 22 it says, In all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. That's amazing. Then in verse 1, Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to, the present, uh, to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, from whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From coming, going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? And still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause? And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. But put forth thine hand now, and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. So do things to him, but don't kill him. So when Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot to, to the, unto his crown, and he took him a potsherd to scrape himself with all, and he sat down among the ashes. Then said his wife unto him, this is encouraging, Dost thou still remain or retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. That's, guys, that's, young men, that's the kind of woman you don't want to marry. <laughs> okay? And, uh, but he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive God good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? Is all this not our di did, and all this did not Job sin with his lips? Now the devil was trying to get any place he could in Job's lives. He wanted to get in. God said, "Okay, you can have it, but he's not going to turn his back on me. You can do this to his life. Not going to turn his back on me." He wanted the highest place in Job's life. He wanted Job, this is what he wanted Job to do. Because this is what's going to hurt the Lord. And that's ultimately what he's trying to do. We're just pawn pieces. We're just pawn pieces. And uh, he wanted Job to deny and turn his back on the Lord. And you know what would have happened? Job, in the process of doing that, Job would have lost his testimony. He wouldn't have had the testimony that he had at that time. He'd have lost it. I don't know. I guess maybe his wife had already lost her testimony through all of it. Everything that was happening, losing her children, losing all their wealth, everything they had was taken from them. But he didn't. Now, this is the testimony of Job. We read it in verse 8 of chapter 1 and verse 3 of chapter 2. 
Let's read those verses again. And the Bible says here, And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? In verse 3 of chapter 2, it says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? And still he holdeth fast his integrity. Although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. What was his testimony? Job was a perfect and upright man. It's a good testimony. Job feared God. That's a good testimony. Job eschewed evil. He got away from it. That's a good testimony. And then the Bible says Job held fast his integrity. You know, there's a problem with integrity today. There's a problem. You know what I preached about? When I got to preach at the, uh, represent, uh, the Republican uh, Representative Caucus, integrity. I preached right here out of Job about you need to have integrity. I had 10 minutes and I preached as hard as I could to 90-something people up there at the State House about integrity. And they don't have any. They all looked me in the face and I said you need integrity. And they don't have any. Very few of them have integrity. I've met a couple of them. Integrity. But that's not just their problem. That's our problem. That's every man's problem is integrity. Doing what's right. And doing what's right. When no one's looking. The place that the devil desires is the highest place in our life. If he can have the highest place, he can really hurt God. Because we are the children of God. And he wants the highest place. Now, I want to tell you that the, about the place that we must defend is our holiness. God is holy, and he wants us to be holy. We are to defend our holiness. Now, what does that look like? Well, in defending it, I want to bring you to Ephesians chapter 6 again. I say again because we went there this morning. I'm not trying to be redundant, but I do realize that some people did not hear the message this morning, and they would not understand if I didn't go back to some passage of Scripture. And so in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10, the Bible says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. By the way, that's the only place you're going to be strong at. And in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against the spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. The armor of God will always give us victory over the methods of the devil. You might want to write that down and remember it. The armor of God will always give us the victory over the methods of the devil. His wiles will never outpower God. They'll out, they'll out think us. They will dupe us. They will be there and trap us. But they won't trap the power of God. And uh, we need the power of God in our lives. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, look at verse 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10. To whom we forgive anything, I forgive, to whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it, in the person of Christ. Now this is why he's talking about forgiving. Get it in the next verse. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. You know, when we talk about forgiveness, it's not just something nice and sweet that we do. You know why you ought to forgive? First of all, He's forgiven you. But you know why else you ought to forgive? And forget and move on and let the Lord heal? 
Because that's the device of Satan, and he's going to use it against you. That's one of his wiles. And he's going to take ground in your life, and there's going to grow that, that root of bitterness in your life, and you're going to be hurt severely. Don't let him take that place in your life. Let's talk about some places to defend. Now, if we're going to defend our holiness, but it goes in multiple areas. And the first place is we need to defend the place of communion. This is the place between us and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the ultimate place. If there's only one place to defend, defend this one. Between us and the Savior. Look at Psalm 91. Psalm 91. Let's look at a couple of verses here in Psalm 91. Verse 1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Verse 9. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. It's where we're dwelling. That's our habitation, is with the Lord, in the presence of the Lord. If we don't have victory here, we don't have victory anywhere else in the Christian life. If we don't have victory with the Lord in this place of communion that the devil wants to take from us. This is the highest ground the devil can take from us, and we typically give this ground up by distractions in our life. How many have got distractions in your life? <laughs> yeah, you, about, you might as well raise both hands because we got distractions coming at you. you. You got way more. Why don't you count the fingers too, okay? We got all those distractions, and if you keep throwing your hands up, that's how many we got. Distractions are coming from every which way, and distractions will distract you from the important things in life. And it'll distract you from having communion with the Lord. Little things <laughs> that mean nothing the devil will use and distract you from the Lord. He'll use things in our life to distract us or get our mind off of spending time with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If we're thinking about Jesus, or if we're not thinking about Jesus, we're probably not going to spend time with Him. What do you think? Probably not. Probably not. We've got to make sure that we allot Him time, or that time's going to be distracted from, and He won't get our time then. You'll go through a whole day, two days, three days, and say, you know, I haven't prayed in three days. I haven't read the Word of God in three days. Now, that's kind of unimaginable for me, but I do know that there's been times that I went a day and got so distracted that I did not get in the Word of God, and I did not read the Bible. I hit the ground running, and one thing happened before I ever got the chance to do it. But some people go weeks and keep getting distracted in their communion with the Lord. They've given that place up to the devil, and all these other things are just weeds in their life that are keeping them. And it's not just bad things. It's good things that get our attention away from the Lord Jesus Christ. Could be friends, could be TV, it could be uh, video games, it could be movies, it could be texting, it could be Facebook, it could be any activity, any sport, anything that you like to do. It could be a hobby, anything that takes up our time. What are some of the things that take up your time? Don't answer. What are they? You're already thinking about them. You're thinking about things that just suck your time in your life. And, I'm, and not necessarily are they bad. Not necessarily are they... A, Thou shalt not. But what is sucking your time up is taking the place of communion in your life. I encourage you to make a, a daily schedule and see what you spend your time on. When was the last time you thought through your week and thought, this is the time I spend doing this, this is the time I spend with my family, this is the time I spend with the Lord, this is... When was the last time you evaluated that? What are you wasting your time on when you could be spending with the Lord in His Word and prayer, telling other people about Jesus? You have more time than you think you have if you'll evaluate it, and then you can get some time to commune specifically with the Lord and then keep communing with Him in amidst all the other activities that are now spending your time on, and you can commune with them. There's nothing wrong with having fun but when our fun keeps us from Jesus, it becomes wrong. I like to have fun. But if it keeps me from Jesus, it's going to be wrong. Above all else, the devil wants to keep us from spending time with Jesus. And if the devil can distract us and keep us from spending time with Jesus, then everything else in our lives is going to fall apart. So we must defend the place of communion. If there's no communion with the Lord, 
There's no holiness. There's no holiness in our life. So we must also defend not only communion, but we must defend the place of instruction. Now this would be the place between us and the authority in our life. Look at uh, Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Who wants to be called a fool? Yeah, not as many people have said they had distractions in their lives. Okay? You despise wisdom, you despise instruction. And you, that's who you become. Verse 8, My son, hear the instruction of thy father. Forsake not the law of thy mother. For they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head and chains about thy neck. We cannot receive what the Lord wants us to have if the devil gets this place in our life. We cannot be wrong with those in authority and be right with the Lord. It is impossible for us to disobey those in authority and obey the Lord unless those that are in authority are using their authority for evil and they're commanding us to do evil. Now that's an exception. The place of authority, the place of instruction in our life. Who are the authorities in your life? Who are your authorities at home? Who are your authorities when you go to school? Who are the authorities at work? How about in your city in which you live? How about when you go and you have hobbies and you have playtime, right? Who's in the authorities there? How about in the church? We are, di we are disobeying Jesus when we disobey those who he's put in our lives to help us. Okay? You can't be right with him if you're wrong with everybody else. Rebellion's rebellion. <laughs> now, unless it's righteous rebellion. And, and that's what all children do. Parents, you can laugh. They righteously rebel. Okay? Um, look at 1 Thessalonians. Chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 12. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you. That's authority. In the Lord. And admonish you. And to esteem them, those that are over you in the Lord, to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. Now, it's not because it's their work, it's because the work they're doing is for the Lord. That's why they're highly, um, to esteem them very highly there. Now, if we cannot obey human authority, how will we obey heavenly authority? Good question, isn't it? Because if we have a rebellious heart against human authority, how can we not have a same rebellious heart against God? If we are surrendered and humbled before God and, we're, and we are subjecting ourselves to God and doing His will in our life, then what's the chance that maybe we're going to be the same way to other people and humble and encounter people with humility instead of, I'm the authority here, <laughs> right? We quit rebelling in our heart against the Lord and we don't rebel against authority in our life. Now, Obedience is when we do what we're told, when we're told to do it, with the right attitude. Now, that obviously goes first and foremost to the Lord. And the right attitude does matter when we obey the Lord. If the devil can get us to disobey our authorities, then it will be easier for him to keep us from spending time with Jesus. That's what he wants in our life. And if we're disobeying the Lord, we probably won't want to be with him. So if this instruction part's wrong, it's going to also mess up the communion part. That's why the communion part has to come first to fix the instruction part. And then we come to a third part. We must defend the place of fellowship. This is between us and other believers. This is a place that the devil wants to get in our life. He wants to get between us and authority. He wants to get between us and the Lord. And he wants to get between us and each other. That's what he wants. In Ephesians chapter 4, so we go back to the context here that we were looking at. In Ephesians chapter 4, we come to verse 27 that says, Neither give place to the devil. But what does it say around that? Let's go back to verse 25. And the Bible says, Wherefore, put away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, 
for we are members one of another. So we're not to lie to anyone, especially our brother or sister in Christ. Right? Not to be lying to each other. Verse 26 says, Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Look at verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. We are to forgive others as quickly as possible, especially our brother or sister in, in Christ. It's talking about this place the devil wants to get with us and other believers. The Bible says in verse 28, Let him that steal, stole, steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. We're not to steal from others, but we're to give to others, especially our brothers or sisters in Christ. This place between us. Verse 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. We are not to talk bad about others, but build them up and encourage them with our words, especially our brothers and sisters in Christ. Don't let the devil take that place that he wants to take because that causes divisions, it causes strife, it causes um, everything imaginable. Schisms in the body, the body of Christ. We are to deal with things quickly and put everything from between us and our brothers and sisters in Christ. That's how we ought to do it. And when we don't do this, we're giving the devil this place in our lives, and it's going to destroy us. If the devil gets this place, then we will lie, we won't forgive, we're going to steal and use our words to hurt others. And that will affect the place of instruction and, the, and communion in our lives. It's all going to affect each other. We all got to watch these places the devil's trying to get. And let me tell you one more place. We must defend the, defend the place of service. This is between us and the lost world. We have to defend the place of service in our life. Now, what am I talking about? I want you to go to John chapter 15 with me. John chapter 15 and verse 16. Jesus is speaking to his disciples here about abiding in the vine and how he was the vine and, they were, and the believers are branches. And how he wants to work through them and give them power and please him. And then verse 16 says, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. So the Bible says go and bring forth fruit. Now we have to go before we can bring forth fruit. We have to go. We have to go. Now, the fruit of the Spirit comes through abiding in Christ. We get the fruit of the Spirit. We talked about that earlier, how that's what the devil wants to take from us. It's always taken. He wants to take those things from us. But what is the fruit of a believer that comes, not just the fruit of the Spirit, but the fruit of the believer that comes through abiding in Christ? It's another believer. I come to know the Lord as my personal Savior, and because I come to know the Lord as my personal Savior, now I can tell someone else about Jesus Christ and what He's done to me because I'm supposed to be a witness, the Bible says. And when I do, then I can bear that fruit and see, eventually, I'm going to see someone else come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. This is our service. Look at Matthew chapter 7 with me. It's very important that we're not let the devil get this place between us and the lost world. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 22. Many will say to me in that day, this is Jesus speaking here, and he says, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I, Jesus speaking, well, I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, 
ye that work iniquity. I want you to understand that he didn't say, I knew you at one time, but now I don't know you anymore. He said, I never knew you. He didn't say you had part in me, and because you were so bad, I decided to kick you out of my family. He said, I never knew you. You did these things, but it wasn't because you were in me. I never knew you. And when the Bible talks about this, when he says depart, it's for all eternity. This isn't like he's saying come back tomorrow and check and see if I know you. No, this is at the end. This is when it's all done. And in chapter 25 and verse 41 of Matthew, Matthew chapter 25 and verse 41, Jesus says this, Then shall he also so I say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So I told you, he didn't prepare it for us, he prepared it for the devil and his angels. And it's everlasting fire. You don't want to hear depart. And you don't want anybody else to hear depart. That's not going to be a good day. And there's going to be a lot of religious people say, Lord, Lord, weren't we faithful to church? Didn't we try to keep all the commandments? Didn't we do this? Didn't we do that? They just say, depart from me. I never knew you. I never knew you. You never trusted me. You never trusted and accepted what I did for you. You tried to do it all for me, but it doesn't work that way. We have to come through Jesus. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We'll close with this Bible verse, or verses. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning in verse 3. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Question. What's our gospel? The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel, according to the scriptures. In whom, so it's hid, that's only hid to the lost. Because anybody who's saved already knows the gospel. Because they had to know the gospel in order to be saved, to believe on Jesus. So you're not hiding it. If you never tell me about Jesus, you're not hiding it from me. I already know about him. You're hiding it from that person that you never tell that's on their way to this place that's going to last forever and it's going to be in torment in a lake of fire that was prepared for the devil and his angels. That's who you're hiding it from. Right? So if you tell another believer and they get upset with you because you tried to tell them about Jesus, well, they might not be a believer. But if you do that, so what? It could have been somebody that's going to be departed from the Lord forever. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. In whom, this is talking about the lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. He is blinding every lost man today. They've got a blinder on. They cannot see at all. And they need somebody to come along and share the gospel, the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, this is our service for the Lord. This is our number one service for the Lord. Between us and the lost. The devil is trying to keep that from happening. Trying to keep us from being right with each other. Trying to keep us from being right with the authorities in our life. Trying to keep us from being right with the Lord Jesus Christ in our life. He's trying to get these places in our life. And if the devil gets this place of service in our lives, then he will then we will not be getting the gospel of Jesus Christ to the lost world. And if the lost world doesn't receive Jesus Christ as their Savior, then they will die and they'll go to the same place that was prepared for the devil. And we don't want that. I hope you don't want that. Now, the devil has a desire and a way of getting what he desires. So be prepared. Because he desires something for your life, and it's not what the Lord desires for it. And he wants to take that place and he doesn't want to give it back. He actually wants to take another place. And by the way, the Lord wants to take back those places that he gave you and you gave up. And he wants to take back another one and another one too. And the battle's on. The battle's on for the devil trying to take a place and the Lord taking his rightful place. The Lord has given, given us the victory, but it's only in him. 
If we keep saying yes to Jesus, if we'll say yes to him tonight, and we'll say yes to him tomorrow, and then say yes the day after, then he'll help us defend the places in our lives that we need to defend. And he'll even help us to take back some places or place or places in our lives that the devil has taken from us. He'll help us get them back. But that's only in the Lord. And it's time to take back the ground that we've lost. You lost some ground? I've lost some ground. Take it back and don't give it back. Neither give place to the devil. There's no reason why we should. He's done nothing for us. Father, thank you for your word tonight. And I pray you'd help us to remember the devil, he deserves to go and be in the lake of fire forever. He desires to get that highest place in our lives. And he does. He desires to take that and take our communion with you and our, uh, our instruction from our authorities. He desires to take the place in between us and other believers, our fellowship, and then our service for you, Lord, to a lost and dying world. And so often he, we get distracted. And we don't purposely say no to you. But because of that distraction, we say no to you. And these places are quietly taken when we didn't even realize. And he doesn't want to give them back. Lord, give us victory tonight. Help us to identify that. Help us to observe our life this week and figure out there's some places that are getting dangerous because we're being distracted and we need to Defend the places here that we've talked about. Maybe other places you put on our hearts tonight. Would you help us to say yes to you at this time? We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Heads bowed, eyes closed, altars are open. Maybe you're here tonight and you say, Brother Justin, if I died right now, I'm not on my way to heaven. I'm going to raise my hand and say, I'm not on my way to heaven, Brother Justin. You listening? Listen up. I'm afraid that I would spend eternity separated from God tonight because I don't know Him. Would you be bold enough to raise your hand and say, I'm concerned about my soul? Would you pray for me, Brother Justin? Believers, altars are open. Are you defending the place of communion in your life? Are you spending time alone with Jesus? You say, no, I, I need to do something about that. Tell it to the Lord. Are you defending the place of instruction in your life? Are you obeying your authorities? If you say no, then you need to do something about that. If you have that rebellious heart, and that heart that says, I'm not doing what anybody else tells me to do, then you need to get that rebellion taken care of before the Lord. Are you defending the place of fellowship? How's your relationship with other believers? How's that going? If you can't have fellowship with other believers, how can we even have fellowship with the Lord like we ought to? He's the one that makes that possible. He's all of our Father, if we know Him. Are you defending the place of service? How's your service for the Lord and your concern for the lost? Ask the Lord to renew your desire for the lost. Ask the Lord to help you to take back the places that you have given up in your life. You might have given up some places between the service this morning and tonight. It's that easy. Between the last time we met last week and this week. If we're not careful, we'll give up place between now and Wednesday. That's why Wednesday is the most encouraging service of the week. Because we need to get back and be reminded to, to defend. Would you ask the Lord to help you? Father, thank you for your word again. Thank you that we can look in your word, that we can be encouraged by your word, we can be reproved and rebuked by your word, corrected, uh, shown us and taught in all instruction and righteousness. And Father, we sure do need that in our life. We just need to take a stand. We know the devil's out to get us. 
And we pray you'd make us sober and vigilant and steadfast against him, especially in these areas of our life that we talked about tonight. Lord, help us to be victorious in our personal, private devotion time with you. That we'll spend the time we ought to in our hearts, in spirit and in truth, worshiping you on our own and find all the strength that we need. Would we put that priority in our life, Lord, and, and give you the highest place in our life and there's no way the devil will be able to get that from us. Please guide our thoughts and our hearts tonight, this week as we go.